guys. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, hey, uh, listen, Meg Gardner's coming on the show. Uh, yeah, the British author. Sure, you can try your British accents. All right, send me your clips when you're done. All right, bye. Here we go. How you doing, Governor? That doesn't even make any sense. Fancy a cup of what? Tea? Who the hell drinks tea? Fancy one. Like a, fa like a fancy cup? Hello, Governor. Hello, Governor. Hello, Governor. I'm chuffed to bits. Is are they joking with me? This is ridiculous. Would you like a spot of tea? Would you like a spot? Fancy a cup, huh? Spot of tea, spot of tea, spot of tea. Ah, oh, blooming egg. Knackered. N knackered. N knickered. I don't, I don't even know. I'm not saying any of these things. She's American, you idiots. Well, it's too late to change the show now. Today on the Crew Reviews, uh, we have the privilege of hosting best-selling thriller author Meg Gardner. Along her journey of writing 14 critically acclaimed novels, including three standalone books, the Joe Beckett series, the Evan Delaney series, and her latest unsub series, Meg has won numerous awards, including the Edgar and Barry Awards. Her title, Unsub, is currently under development as a television series. Before her career in writing, she attended Stanford as a student athlete, lettering across country, and earning an economics degree before attending uh, the Stanford Law School. After practicing as a corporate attorney in Los Angeles, she moved to London with her family and began her writing career there. Upon the family's return to the U.S., her success has achieved meteoric trajectory with no signs of slowing down. And as a three-time Jeopardy champion, Meg will need to tap into her intellectual reserves to withstand the often cruel and demoralizing lightning round questions. Without further ado, let me introduce to you Meg Gardner. All right, everybody, let's uh, thank Meg Gardner for coming on. Hello, Meg. Hey, it's good to be Hello, here. Meg. Hey, Meg. Meg. So, uh, you know, we're going to get right to it here. Uh, let me ask my first question. So this February, your new book comes out, The Dark Corners of the Night, your third unsub novel. It's a bookshelves. So when you do your research for these books, um, have you ever an interviewed a sociopath or anybody with sort of the typical medical conditions that you might find in your books? I don't need to go interview sociopaths. I come on a podcast like this, Ooh, right? Ouch. Or happy faces in front of me. Oh, man, and uh, I just really? listen to what you all have to say. If, if she only knew how close to the truth that really was. No, it's, it's not it's the first time I've been researched. <laughs> no, I, I have no interest in uh, a clinical interview, uh, getting up close with a psychopath whose entire personality is built about putting one over on people and uh, demonstrating their clout. I'm happy to do research. I did run across one um, person in my own life who I thought was probably a psychopath, and that was a fellow mom and uh, a Cub Scout <laughs> leader, oh, but we don't wow. need to go into that. <laughs> she was a troop leader, but was she? Anyway, <laughs> the whole point of the Unsub novels is it's, uh, it features Caitlin Hendricks, who's a young FBI agent whose entire uh, life is built around hunting serial predators, especially psychopaths. So I do a lot of reading and observation and I'm yeah. staring at each of you in turn. Right? So we should <laughs> it's this guy right over here. 
Which one are you pointing to? I don't it's know. Eric, right? Sure. <laughs> Um, so speaking of serial killers and all that good stuff, and really wanted to talk to you about the unsub series, your newest series. Um, and can you talk to us about the story creation process? Um, and what, what kind of inspired you to start that series? What was that spark to say, you know, this would be a really good new series to start. I decided I was going to write about a law enforcement officer. Uh, Caitlin started out as a as a as a cop, now works for the FBI as a special agent, and that means you got to think of a crime. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's you know it's, she's always going to have work, but there, there's always got to be something that launches the story. And these are crime novels, so there's got to be a crime. The first one had been bubbling around in my mind for ages. Uh, Unsub was sparked by the Zodiac. Hmm. Uh, I grew up in California, and I'm. Uh, old enough to remember actually seeing a police artist sketch in the newspaper of the Zodiac with the, you know, the black hood with the, the strange symbol on the front, yeah. the, the eye holes, the guy holding a gun um, and asking my parents, what's that? Who's that? And having them explain what, uh, what the Zodiac was. And then I, for the next God knows how many years, I was convinced that he was going to come <laughs> through my window at any, you know, any night. Uh, so, it got me so interested in who would do those kinds of crimes, somebody who could not be found, even though he was witnessed many times. Um, the famous uh, drawings of the Zodiac with his, with, with his face visible were police sketches done by San Francisco patrol officers hmm. who apparently drove straight past him on the street. Wow immediately after he had killed a cab driver. He literally walked straight away from multiple uh, crime scenes. He called the, uh, the police to, to confess, to tell them that there had been murders, sometimes literally across the street from the sheriff's office, from the payphone. Yes. And I just was fascinated and horrified by who would do something <laughs> like this and how he got away. Of course, the Zodiac just disappeared. Yeah. Uh, in my twisted uh, thriller writer brain, I thought, okay, if somebody like that uh, goes on a long holiday, what's to stop him from deciding he wants to have a cold case heat up again? What, hmm. you know, what's to stop him from uh, wanting to revisit his glory days and come back? Sure. So that was the genesis of Unsub. Nice. Um, it was about a, 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 a legendary cold case that turns hot again. Um, from 25 years ago and in the present day. And that gave me the idea that you got these cases se you know, separated by a generation, then who would be the, the people hunting this, uh, this, unsub, this unknown subject? And I thought it would be uh, a young cop just rising up and the, the original investigator had been her father who Ooh. could not break the case, who yeah. instead had had the case break him because it was so horrible. So that, you know, it's a family story. <laughs> you know yeah, this family the, story <laughs> that was the thing that i mean obviously the, the crime aspect was very intriguing and latched but i latched on to the her relationship with mac and um i thought it was fascinating and doing a little research about you and knowing that you had a great relationship with your father i was fascinated by that which got me thinking about another question generally protagonists fall into two different categories they're either really heavily um or heavy versions of of the author or they're a version of what the author maybe would like to be or wishes they were at different times. So I was wondering, you have three, you set the standalones aside for a second, but you have three successful series and Evan Delaney, Joe Beckett, Caitlin Hendricks, uh, which one of them falls into the former category and which one the latter? Who's, who's the most like Meg and who's the most like Meg wants oh, to be and who's gosh. like the person who Meg doesn't want to be? Um. <laughs> <laughs> They're, none of them are me, obviously, but um, Evan would probably have more of my characteristics because that was my first series. I wasn't as confident. So I tried to write a character who, um, who was closer to uh, the life I had lived. She, I, I, was a, I was a lawyer for a number of years, so she was a lawyer as well. I figured that, I, that way I didn't have to uh, research a whole other career, a whole other hmm. personality. So that's where I started. Of course, uh, she's younger, faster, better looking, you know, she can, you know, jump higher and she always has the right comeback ready at just the instant you need it instead of like the rest of us who 
think of it as we're walking out of the room when it's too late. Um, <laughs> so uh, Caitlin is, um, she's a lot more driven than I am, I think. And uh, she's a hunter and she's a protector. Uh, I really wanted to build a character around, around that, that that's, those are the obsessions that drive her. And uh, she's got a sense of humor too. That's, that's the thing that connects every single character I write though. I think they have to have a sense of humor. They have to realize that life is absurd and uh, be able to laugh it off when, uh, when the chips are down. <laughs> like our show. <laughs> Very much so. so Meg, you uh, taking a step back, you, you um, I've heard you mention that the U S publishers passed on China Lake. Uh, and the other four books in the series, despite the fact that it, they were extremely well received in the UK where you were living at the time. Um, since we're all authors and therefore experts in rejection, <laughs> how did you handle that particular rejection for, uh, from your home country when the Brits were so eager to publish it and it sold very well? Like, how, you know, how did you deal with that? Trying to pretend, pretending that I'm just wiping right. it off. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no. It it, uh, it was extremely frustrating. Yeah. Uh, on the one hand, I could not complain about uh, the state of play because I was writing novels for a living, which had been my dream since I was a young child. I could see the books on bookshelves in England and France and Hong Kong and Australia. Uh, they were translated into a number of languages, but... I it's wanted awesome. to be published at home. Yeah. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> yeah. So, so, so following up with that, I mean, did you have a strong sense of vindication when those books were finally published here and they ended up, you know, ended up winning the Edgar Award? I was pretty happy. <laughs> <laughs> were you like, take, take that? Yeah. Right? I, 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 did, I, I, I remember uh, hearing the, the, my name in the book, the title of the book announced for the Edgar Awards and walking up and saying I felt like Cinderella. That uh, after yeah. you know feeling like I was just on the outside forever, that uh, that people had recognized it. So it was it was absolutely terrific. And uh, yeah, you got to see my my little yeah, yeah. <laughs> little I see it. Hello to my little friend. <laughs> oh, nice. You should have a big old spotlight on that thing. <laughs> so it's a fantastic award. And, I know. Uh, I mean, it's awesome. it's. Congratulations, Jen. Oh. Just getting that all done. So. <laughs> You're so, as late as the U.S. publishers. Yeah. So you've got three successful series now, and you're really heavy into this third one. Um, are there still stories, you know, from Evan uh, Daly and Joe Beckett? Series, did, do you still have stories waiting to be told with those characters in those series? Actually, uh, there's going to be an Evan Delaney short story published next spring in a Mystery Writers of America anthology of short stories. Oh, no. So, awesome. uh, nice. She'll be making an appearance, and Joe Beckett shows up, even though briefly, in The Dark Corners of the Night. So, oh, I mean, they're, they're really? still they're telling me, you know, like, they, they do kind of poke me in the shoulder and say, you know, what's going on? <laughs> We're still here. <laughs> so. do, you still have, do you still have fans clamoring for those other characters? Someone wrote me this morning asking me what's happening. They want to make sure that they, that they have Don't a forget. happy life. They get married and have babies and, you know, we're <laughs> and calm lives. But I try to tell them that doesn't make it a thriller. <laughs> yeah, no, that's not a thriller at all. No, no, someone has to die. <laughs> yes, I'm sorry. <laughs> that's too Ooh. funny. So speaking of the different series and in, in, in turning back to unsub, so CBS um, bought the rights to unsub before it was even published, which... Congratulations, yeah. first of all. That's that's pretty cool. Um, and I know Hollywood's known for doing all kinds of crazy things and not doing things and doing things. Will you be involved at all in the process? And or would you be willing to if they asked you? Oh, absolutely. I I would not start off being a, a screenwriter or a showrunner. That's that's not my mm -hmm. expertise. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, I would I would love to be involved in uh, in editing, writing, um, overseeing the projects eventually. So I cannot give you any more details. At the moment. Uh, <laughs> a, a little bit. Come on, uh, I, can't, uh, I can't tell you anything right now, but I hope I'll have news before, uh, before too long. Awesome. Oh, boy. But she's smiling, and that's a good sign. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's, that's I think she was, if, did you see her blinking? I think I got, I got <laughs> the most code, code out of her. Yeah. So. <laughs> To get to all to that point, though, you have to be a good writer. 
right? You have hmm. to actually produce a product that others would want to read and then Hollywood would actually want to produce. Uh, so, I mean, there's a starting point for all that. And so while you were in college, you took a creative writing course taught by Ron Hansen, the novelist who wrote The Assassination of, uh, of Jesse James by the character Robert Ford. Yeah. And what would you say was the most important thing that he taught you? He said, every story has a beginning, a muddle, and an end. <laughs> <laughs> like Sounds like my writing. And he said, every ending should be surprising yet inevitable. Hmm. And that has stuck with me more than anything else. It means that you've got, as a writer, you have to uh, keep your audience in suspense. You have to lead them in directions that uh, include misdirection, uh, provide clues, hints, bits of personality for the characters, uh, a rising sense of conflict that the reader senses, but that but you still have to keep some surprises in reserve so that right. when, you, when mm -hmm. you hit that finale and, um, and the, you know, the climax takes place that readers are going to go, wow, I did not see that coming. Well, l let me ask you if um, in previous interviews uh, that we've done with other authors, one in particular, Jack Carr, who's uh, uh, written a couple books, he writes, he takes a sticky note and he puts it on his computer for, um, to remind himself of the theme of what he's writing. And, and the last one was revenge. Well, the his first one was revenge. Do you do something similar to that extent? <laughs> I don't have too many sticky notes, but I've got, I've got. <laughs> notes. <laughs> it's enough. <laughs> book four in the Unsub series that I'm, that I'm working on here. Jeez. So, uh, I mean, I know some people put up the note cards, sticky right. notes. Um, I keep too much of it in my head and then I, then I print it out. And then I, once I wrote an entire subplot on, um, on a cash register role, uh, in the mountains, uh, with my brother-in-law who's a physicist. And I was, this is when I was writing the memory collector, which deals with nanotechnology. And I asked him, I said, so what, what could happen if carbon nanotubes pass the blood brain barrier? Mm -hmm. He's sitting there and he goes, can, can we swear on this, on this show? Oh yeah, <laughs> sure. Oh, yeah, please. <laughs> this, is, this is my, this is my brother-in-law, the physicist, the, 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 the homie father of two from the Midwest. And he said, Hmm, if that happened, that shit could fuck you up. <laughs> the scientist's brain just started downloading to me. <laughs> the floodgates. And I sort of like pulled out a pulled out a like a Kleenex and wrote on that. And I said, okay, I have to get more. And so I we like got to this mountain <laughs> tavern. I went in and I to, just told the bartender, I need I need paper. And he said, I don't have paper. We're a tavern. Uh, I said, give me anything you've got. Napkin. So we pulled the the cash register roll out of. <laughs> Oh, as a cash register and gave it to me. And I started, I just wrote on the whole thing, everything that my brother-in-law told me about, about nanotech. <laughs> See, when physicists talk like that, it's way above my head. I just <laughs> I get lost with language like that. No, uh, um, I wanted to compliment you on, you, you were talking about uh, being surprising and inevitable. And I don't think that there's too many books that fit that description as the end of, as, as the end of Unsub. I okay. thought I knew what was coming and um, I did in one way. And didn't in another. So uh, I'm not going to spoil it for the people who haven't read it yet. But I think I think that lesson <laughs> that lesson stuck there. One of my favorite anecdotes about write about a writer about any writer um, happen, happens to be about you, and it's about how writers help other writers. And um, it involves the master of horror Stephen King, um, and how he kind of went above and beyond what people might expect on your behalf. Can you share a little bit of that story with us? Yeah, this relates to. Uh, my start in publishing where I couldn't get a, an American publisher and I was living in London. I got uh, news from my publisher that Stephen King was coming over for a book tour and they were throwing a, a huge party for him. Um, now for most authors, you know, you're, you're, if you're in the same town as your editor, you, you might get taken out to, to pizza, <laughs> a pizza lunch. <laughs> Stephen King, his British publishers, <clears throat> rent out uh, Middle Temple, which is the hall where Twelfth Night premiered. I mean, like, 
when Shakespeare wrote it. <laughs> Jeez, that's so cool. <laughs> catered, you know, catered dinner and they had Alabama 3 playing with the, the Soprano soundtrack, of course. Yeah. Wow. Um, so I was kind of nervous about going to this. And then I, I found out that, uh, of course, my British publisher had been sending him boxes and boxes of books through the years. Everything they published, they wanted to send to Stephen King. And he'd been sticking them in his closet. <laughs> <laughs> Hmm. Except he needed something to read on the flight on his way to London. And so he went into his closet and spilled a box of books on the floor. And uh, he happened to pick up China Lake and open it up. And I wish I could say that he like read the first paragraph and like gasped with <laughs> the beauty of the prose, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Actually, he decided that the font was nice and big and would not strain his eyes. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever it takes, man. Whatever it doesn't matter. Take. <laughs> so he stuck it in his carry-on and read it on the flight. And when he landed, he told the, the publisher that he loved it. And they gave him all the rest of the books I'd written at the time. And he said, who's asked who my U.S. publisher was? And I said that I didn't have one. And most, most authors would just say, huh, well, that's screwy. <laughs> um, he actually started sending my books around to U.S. publishers. And he wrote a... Um, a blog post encouraging people to read my books wow. and then wow. he wrote a column for entertainment weekly urging people to read my books wow. which was wonderful yes. and horrible for for about 12 hours because i realized that he had written this column because he was still having trouble getting publishers to take me seriously he was wow. handing me novels and they were saying oh who's this american lives in london she's written a series yeah you know we don't pick up series that, that, that have already been you know that have got that are several books in um but within, uh, by the next morning, I had 14 U.S. publishers emailing me. Holy cow. And the power of Stephen King. Wow. That, had to be, that had to be surreal to have someone like him write he, a He's a big dog about. and he barks people listen. But you know what? He's, <laughs> he's an extremely generous person. I cannot thank him enough. He, um, he pays it forward every day for writers, uh, musicians, artists, Especially, you know, after he uh, was hit by a mm. van and nearly yeah. yeah, he started a, a foundation to um, a nonprofit to help fund medical needs for writers who didn't have uh, insurance. So that's what he's. Wow. That's that's how far he goes to help other other authors and and, and artists. So he's a good guy. He's got a big heart. <laughs> At all. Yeah. He reminded me of like my favorite high school English teachers. It was, uh, it was really wonderful to get a chance to to thank him in person. So, you know, you were an attorney. We all know that. Um, were the doctor did not get to send to give me any, any attorney jokes. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> that goes my whole day. Yeah. Um, so the question is, is, you know, um, what were some of the things that you brought from a legal standpoint from that career into writing um, that might have assisted you early on that you might not have otherwise, you know, for instance, what's a, you know, writing a legal brief, how would that be similar to, say, outlining, uh, you know, a particular novel? Is there any similarities there? That's a great question. And it, it actually, it translates less and more than you would think. Uh, when I first started writing fiction, I had to let go of trying to, you know, like, fill in the, the you know, show, show, show my work as far as yeah. you know, statute or which case law would, would oh, yeah. apply to, to this story, because that's not what, what it's about. But... When, you, when you're a trial lawyer, when you write briefs, you are trying to persuade mm. uh, the court. Yeah. And every legal case is a story. It's a narrative. It's a tale of something that has gone wrong between parties. There's conflict mm. between them, just like in, a, in fiction. Yeah. And as a lawyer, it's your, it's your ethical obligation as an advocate to present your client's story in as compelling a fashion as you possibly can to convince the judge or the jury of the justice of, of your case. Mm -hmm. So you have to learn to write extremely persuasively. You have to learn to anticipate rebuttals, figure out what's, who's, what the opposite, you know, the opposing counsel, what are they going to come back at? Then nobody's going to leave you when you, when you state X, Y, and Z. You have to, you have to be ready for what, what's coming back at you. So that, that anticipates what readers will say if you yeah. kind of gloss over plot holes. Um, you just, you just have to learn how to really 
nail the, you know, the law, but as, as well present your client's story in a really sympathetic and persuasive way. So hmm. that was extremely, extremely helpful as far as moving into fiction. Makes but sense. of course, if you blow the, the story in a book, you're just going to get, you know, whiny emails from a reader. <laughs> <laughs> hold against your client and tell them to pay a hundred thousand bucks. To, to yeah. <laughs> our, our previous guest, Mark Greeny, he's Greeny. He said the, uh, he's like, the exact same thing the emails he would get from people just the strange comments about x y or z he goes there's he goes sometimes i write just to cover my ass with some <laughs> of the stuff right because you just don't want those emails coming back at you yeah um so i know you began your writing very young and uh, you even attempted a novel at <laughs> age 16 and i heard i heard you talk you about that. you dived way down into this yeah it was, it was pretty funny i you know with the headlights and the the piles of bodies and it was it was pretty funny um, you went on to earn an undergrad and law degree from Stanford. Congratulations. That's awesome. Right. You practice law in, in uh, Los Angeles, like we, you just talked about, and even taught a college writing program. But it wasn't until you actually moved to, to London that you began to write thrillers. Why? Well, like, what, what was the catalyst for the, for the jump into thrillers? What happened in London? <laughs> what happened in London? <laughs> I can't tell you. It's not that <laughs> I Next honestly, book. I had, I had attempted, you know, several times to start a thriller uh, before we moved. And um, th that was when I had to teach myself to outline because I had no idea what I was doing. I realized that you can't just jump from, from teaching or from writing legal memos to, to writing fiction. It's an entirely different skill set that you have to train yourself to yeah. do. But what, what actually, um, made it possible was that we moved to London because my husband was offered a job there. So we went uh, on, on his expat package and I did not go with a, with a job in hand. And that was the first time we'd have had all the children, at least in preschool. Oh, <laughs> so you had some free time. You had some you time. <laughs> I mean, it, the first six months you, you move to another country and it's just learning how to, how to, how to live and how to shop and how to make your way around without getting lost for six hours. But after that, <laughs> I had some time and that's when I realized it was time to put up or shut up. I mean, I've been telling everybody for, for several years that I, I would love to write a novel and now I had the chance to do it. So I had, I had to do it and it, you know, I wrote a novel and it yeah. was really horrible. So I wrote, <laughs> <laughs> I wrote it <laughs> You didn't just write a bad chapter. You wrote a bad book. Yeah. <laughs> No. Well, that's before edits, you know. Yeah, before edits, yeah. <laughs> so. so talking about London and talking about travel, um, you know, there's a dichotomy sometimes with writers. Sometimes writers are very introverted. Some writers like to just not travel unless they absolutely have to. If you're going to make me go on a book tour, you make me get a thriller fest in New York, whatever, but I'd rather stay home. Um, so the question is, do you enjoy traveling or are you a homebody? Um, how, how, how is it for Meg? What would you rather do? <laughs> I love to travel. I, I am an introvert. I love, I love, I can go for days or, or at least a week just, just by myself working. I, th I think that's just awesome. <laughs> Comfortable. Uh, past that, past that, I get a little, I get a little goofy. And I, 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 I remember once my husband and kids went to visit, uh, visit grandma so I could stay home and write. And after a few days, I said, you need to come home because otherwise I'm going to like set up a tea party for the dog and cat. <laughs> but I, I love travel. I love going to conferences because those are, those are my people. It's where I meet all you guys and we get yeah. to spend uh, days just talking about books and writing and what could, yeah. be, what could be better. So my follow-up to that would be, great. I'm glad you're a traveler because I think all of us here have that travel bug in us that we just love to love to get out and see the, the world, which is an amazing place. Um, what's on your bucket list? What, what's still there that, man, if I could do this, I would do that or? I, I made a promise with uh, my high school uh, VFF that we're going to go zip lining over uh, some of these waterfalls in, uh, down on the Brazil, Argentina border. So that's okay. still on the bucket list. Uh, haven't been to Hong Kong. 
uh, need might to want to hold on. Hang on. I want to hold off on that. Hold off. I'm going to hold off on Hong Kong. I think the airport's a little busy not, right not, now. Not right now, but yeah. <laughs> uh, I haven't been there. I've had a chance to see a whole lot of wonderful places that I never imagined I'd, I'd get the opportunity to go from, I mean, living in London, <laughs> getting to travel through Europe on the cheap with no jet lag mm -hmm. with kids, Scandinavia, France, Italy, um, the Middle East. I've been to Southern Africa several times and had just the most amazing experiences. Singapore, Thailand. So it's been uh, it's it's a big planet, and there's a whole lot to see. And there's uh, a lot, there is a lot more, more to go. Well, somewhat related, um, <laughs> has delving into some of the worlds you've delved into in your fiction made you more. Um, selective of where and how you travel uh, i know when i read unsub i thought about being an agoraphobic for a little while <laughs> <laughs> that makes me so happy <laughs> no not at all i mean i i'm having lived in a um, in a big city taught me no you don't you know you make sure you keep an eye on on all your belongings and uh, be you know have situational awareness but you're more likely to get, you know, the, the modern version of the artful dodger in London than, than any other problem. <laughs> but, uh, no, just uh, it taught me that 24-hour uh, trips in the back of the plane are not something I want to do frequently anymore. <laughs> mm -hmm. All right. So are you the type of person that requires a, you know, the room has to be a certain way or the it to be quiet or what do you have like an environment that you kind of seem to operate in the best or kind of do your best work in? I have the office here. No, I was really happy yeah. that I have an office. Once I had a, had a place with a door I could, I could shut. Um, that made me very happy that uh, because I like to have, the ability to focus. That said, I've also trained myself to write wherever and whenever I can. And uh, sometimes I go down to a local coffee place to write just to change the scenery. I have discovered that writing on planes is actually really good and really easy because I don't get the Wi-Fi. And, uh, you know, checking YouTube, no, no Twitter. And otherwise, I'm like a like I write a I'm like a like a little hamster looking for its pellet you know right <laughs> i want a reward <laughs> so true the video or twitter or something so yeah i see myself to focus i'm like oh my god i look at I've, I've, i wrote 10 pages here in the last hour what how'd that happen oh you can't look up headlines at thirty thousand feet so exactly oh you don't have your passenger right next to you looking over your shoulder though they're like whoa you're right or what's that nobody's Wait. ever actually asked me that um I have had passengers help me out. Uh, there was one flight where my pen exploded at thirty thousand feet. Nice. It was like it was like the uh, the alien had just like <laughs> <laughs> mm. all over the, the tray table and all over my work. But luckily, it didn't get anybody else. And there was a there was a, a family across the aisle who had uh, two babies, and they had they just pulled out the wet wipes. <laughs> oh, <laughs> perfect. They're sad. Yeah. They knew what they were doing. Perfect. Hey, Meg, so I'm looking over your, your, your right shoulder and I see, I mean, your bookshelf is really nice, but you have a stack of papers there. And so I'm curious, um, what do you do with versions of stories that you don't use? Do you keep <laughs> them hidden in some filing cabinet or do you trash them or do you just shove them on the bookshelf? I, if I've worked for, for a significant amount of time on something, I always save it. I yeah. save a version of it. Because even if I edit it uh, for length or whatever, there may be an idea in it that I will wish I had not discarded. So I'll hang on to it. Um, I recycle a heck of a lot, but I, I don't want to discard everything. It's, uh, you have to winnow, that's the thing. That, that's always the problem with, with, with starting a book, I find, is that I have too many ideas. I see, I see it as a fractal, you know. Mm -hmm. Uh, thing where you can go in 19 different directions and I never want to cut it down but until I realized that well the book is not going to be 19 different stories it just has to be one so you, have to, one, yeah. Yeah. you have to figure out the, the best one for for this for this story mm -hmm. uh, do you still have your cash register tape <laughs> I do, <laughs> you do. There you go. Okay. <laughs> that's something I would do too that's, that's, I came you put that on eBay and that will probably sell yeah. 
or Faramel. And I'll figure out how to make some kind of killer nano. nano <laughs> yeah, that's really scary, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I come from a screenwriting background, and and I have I definitely have some story ideas, kind of like you said, where you have to winnow down. But sometimes I just have a line of dialogue that. I cut from something and I'm just like, oh, I got to use that sometime. I probably one of my favorite lines I've ever written. I haven't found anything to put it in. So I'm just, you, just may, you may, you may, you yeah. may, sometimes I feel like you can shoehorn it in and it, it's not quite right. But <laughs> I, ha I had a, a line about pop tarts that I cut from a book that was never published. And, and like 15 years later, I figured out that it was a, it was an appropriate, <laughs> appropriate. Pop tart. Or, and what book, what book is that in Meg? Ransom river. <laughs> I'm gonna write that out. <laughs> <laughs> Phantom instinct. Okay. Just for fan. So um, I, I've said to these guys and to other people, I, I kind of think this is the golden age of the thriller. I think there are, there are more really good thriller writers working right now than at any other time. And a big aspect of that is I think that there are more women thriller writers at the top of their game right now. Mm -hmm. um, and since you are our first female guest, not our last, mm -hmm. we have several scheduled soon. Yes. But um, I want to ask a gender question. Um, I know when I talk to male thriller writers, I, I just, the disguise, under their disguise, they all want to be their character. They all want to be that, that hard ass that, you know, can do everything. And it's, you know, li living vicariously through their character. Is it the same for women? Or I, I read a recent article that had another idea why so many women gravitate towards writing thrillers, but I'm, I'm curious as to you, what, what drew you to thrillers and um, maybe what do you think has drawn so many women into being top notch thriller writers? Well, I think it's uh, as far as how many women have gone into it. It's, it's, it's like, um, it's like sports. It's like track and field where, you know, the, the records started falling when uh, the world, you know, came into the sport when it wasn't just, you know, the, the, the chariots of fire guys, as much as I like them from, you know, from, from the university, but uh, yeah. it was from, it was the people from Australia and, uh, and Mexico and Kenya and Ethiopia that, that suddenly people realized that there was this opportunity and it's something that they love. So I think women, um, I got into it because I, thrillers were what I love to read. I mean, I, I remember being, you know, in second grade and watching some kind of Disney mystery on the, on Sunday nights and thinking like, hmm. why doesn't that ever happen in my neighborhood? <laughs> <laughs> I really wanted to be involved in a crime. Was like, Ooh, why doesn't somebody's bike get stolen? And, and my, my, my friends and I'd be the ones that, that solve it, <laughs> the, yeah. solve the mystery. But I, um, I just, by the time I was in high school, I was reading science fiction thrillers and I, that was what gripped me. That was just, you know, the, the, the big plots where people have their backs up against the wall, their lives, you know, their worlds are falling apart. The stakes are life and death for them, their family, their community, or perhaps the world. And it's up to them to rise to the occasion. And I decided if I was going to spend all that time writing something, I wanted it to be the kind of thing that I would like to read. So um, I thought... Why not? And I threw it. I threw the characters in there that uh, I would like to spend time with, which are probably not too different from me. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, and there's a whole bunch of people who enjoy it too. Met some um, some some more women who've been FBI agents or in you know ATF, NSA, whatever. I'm, who knows if I was graduating from law school today, whether I would have whether I would take an interview uh, somewhere somewhere in that line of work. But I just I just really wanted to write. Mm -hmm. And yeah. I could not imagine anything better than getting to get paid to tell stories straight out on, of your imagination. On that note, I like, I like to always uh, uh, talk about my wife, but she's, uh, she's a Secret Service agent. And I was cool. a former Secret Service agent. My wife is a Secret Service agent. And so um, I, I see what she does and damn, am I proud of her. I mean, just, just awesome. So, yeah. Yeah. That's exciting. Yeah. yeah. Well, one, one of the things, and a real quick follow-up on that, one of the things that I think has been – different for everybody in thrillers is when women became more um, prominent in the genre, I think we started really reading real women. I mean, I honestly think that there was a lot yeah. of early, mm -hmm. early attempts at writing women by men that, that were just almost cursory. And I think that there are gr some men that can write great women now, but I don't think that that was true until they looked, Oh, Hey, this is what a woman's like. <laughs> Be, and it could be a <laughs> structure of publishing where it was men writing and male editors were reading it. Um, Very good point. Yeah. Right. 
so they everything sounded legit to them but it's like me you know writing a draft and handing it to my husband and saying what do you think of this scene he's like dude's not going to do that <laughs> <laughs> right <laughs> not happening <laughs> oh, fixing that. but yeah i mean uh, I, I hope I write men and women uh, who seem like actual human beings. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, of course, I can, I can bring, you know, my experience uh, living in the world as a woman to, uh, from, you know, writing a character like that from, from the inside out, which I find a lot of fun. Uh, so, uh, you know, you got to write good guys, bad guys, grown-ups, immature people, psychopaths and heroes, and mm -hmm. uh, you, you want them all to seem like they actually could be walking around in the world. <laughs> So you're Your psychopaths about my scare me. <laughs> I know. Would, it, would, would you say? Would you say? Said, sounds like she's writing a book about my family. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so talking though about something you wrote and how it resonated with you and just the pride in doing that. Um, I listened to Unsub actually on CD, which sometimes I I do that now just because of time with mm -hmm. nine to five job, working with these guys now doing a podcast, having a family, writing. I, there's not enough hours in the day, so I read as much as I can. But sometimes CDs are a great way, especially if I find someone that's got a great voice. So I loved Unsub on CD. Oh, good. And the only problem I had is sometimes I'll be reading a book and I'll come across a line and I'll write it down. Well, I had to actually like stop what I was doing like and rewind a couple times. So I don't want to say what character or what was happening to this character, but this line resonated with me. And I just, how does it feel to write something like this? So towards the end of Unsub, one of the lines was chasing after something that had fled across the divide, which she couldn't follow. And oh. <laughs> to me, that was like, per, for what was going on in the, in the in the story right there, it was so emotional, and it but it was powerful. It's like oh. when that happened, you're just like it. Just I had to write it down. I grabbed oh, the sticky yeah. note, had to get the pen, and um. So what's that feel like for you as an author when you write something? Do you have those moments where you write something and you're just like, damn, I did that is so good. Or, man, <laughs> <laughs> well, I, wait, I wait to hear from readers. Who, if, from, if, okay. the, I'll email you that later, by the way. So you have an email. I'm very happy. That. I'm really grateful. Thank you for letting me know. I mean, of course, as, as fiction writers, we're trying to give the readers an emotional experience. Absolutely. That's yeah. what, that's what the story is. We want them to feel like they are in there uh, with the characters uh, experiencing the ups, downs, the excitement, the terror, the joy, and have them feel like they've uh, really gone through it themselves. That's why, that's, look at the name of the genre, yeah. thriller. Yeah. It's, the book has got to thrill. It's got to cause uh, a physical and emotional reaction in the reader for, for it to even succeed at all. So uh, that's the fun part of it. That, that's why I read them. I know, me too, <laughs> right? Yeah. Right. Uh, all right, so <clears throat> here we go. Uh -oh. All right. So Hold I don't on. know. I don't know. I want to take a drink. Nah. <clears throat> so I, I'm just going to throw it out there for our viewers that uh, Meg, I read that you uh, that you were a what three time Jeopardy uh, champion. Is that right? Mm -hmm. That's right. So cool. Right. <laughs> so uh, with that in mind, we are going into what's called the lightning round, ding, ding, and ding. Uh, you're going to have to put all of that intellect into full focus <laughs> to get through this. Or or not. <laughs> or Let's be honest. <laughs> we put we very little against each other here. Yeah. We put very little thought on these questions, so please don't put a lot of thought into them. <laughs> and uh being today's uh, host, I'm going to start this off. We you this is stream of thought. You just come out with what comes up. And I'm gonna start off with a creepier character, Hannibal Lecter or Buffalo Bill. <laughs> Buffalo Bill is creepier. <laughs> Very creepy. Yes. <laughs> All right. <laughs> it puts the lotion in the basket. Uh, yes, yeah. <laughs> you got it. All right. All right. <clears throat> this is a trick question. Oh. Favorite English food dish? Curry. <laughs> no, the answer is none. None. <laughs> none. <laughs> uh, all right. <clears throat> a psychological profile or a forensic pathology? Of you four? <laughs> it probably would be Dude, most likely. We walked right into that one, Mike. Thank you. <laughs> Psychological profiles first. Thanks, Mike. Psychological profile. All right. Number four. City or country? City. Mm. City girl. All right. And uh, my last one. Candlelit dinner or skydiving? 
to cancel at dinner. <laughs> <laughs> my daughter's the only one in the family who's gone skydiving and, and oh. like, and you lived enough through that, that right? Her. <laughs> yeah. Props to her. I yeah. have no hair. This is just a wig. <laughs> <laughs> I would never jump out of a plane. That's crazy right. talk. Too funny. Okay, I believe I am up. Uh, the better way to go, you want to be shot or stabbed? Shot, because then I figured they'll miss. <laughs> they'll oh. miss. Or be faster, maybe, but yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, you never know. Okay, so Friday night in my house is pizza night. What's on your pizza? Mozzarella, basil, tomatoes, artichokes, ham, uh, anything else except pineapple. Except oh, pineapple. thank God. Um, yeah. That was our most sophisticated pizza answer of the year. By the way. <laughs> <laughs> that kind of made me hungry, though. Interviewing guys, exactly. it's like it's pepperoni, <laughs> sausage. <laughs> So who is a better character to write, a vigilante or an anarchist? Vigilante, they, because they can be an anti-hero as well as a, a villain. I think sure. they have a broader uh, scope for, what, for how, to, how to shape them and have their goals. They have goals instead of just chaos, right. I think. Uh, too intelligent of an answer. We don't want we don't that. <laughs> Let me go put on my spandex in my <laughs> There you go. <laughs> Next time. Speaking of spandex and in, 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 the, in the things, no. Um, no. So <laughs> a glass of Jack or a fruity mixed drink? What's Meg drinking? Oh, the Jack. The Jack. Oh, yeah. That's a thriller writer right there. <laughs> oh, yeah. That's, That's pretty cool. I peanut M&M's. <laughs> Oh yeah. Dude, dude, right. Now totally I know which characters us. are more like you and which ones aren't. <laughs> <laughs> Answered the previous question. So my final question, um, you obviously are in Texas. So what is the better city? And Austin is not an option. You can't go for a third option. Dallas or Houston? I spent more time in Houston, so I'll have to go with Houston. Go with Houston. You get off the freeways and you find there's a whole world of right. food and people and uh, bookstores and museums and sports. And that place is huge. And humidity and... <laughs> yeah, and Houston sprawls. It's, yeah, it's well, like a big say, concrete jungle. Well, and you live in, living in Austin, that's, I've been to Texas a bunch and I've never been to Austin and everyone always says you've got to go just for the food and the live music alone. Oh, yeah. No, it's, it's so it's, amazing it's to go, city. so... And the one thing about living in Texas here, I ran to get myself a, a bottle of water, but you'll see because it's Texas, it has to have Texas on the label. Oh yeah, I gotta have the label on there. It has to have the national, star, huh? The national drink of Texas here, I'm guessing. <laughs> well, you're, you're, you're a California native, right, Meg? I'm an Oklahoma native, but I grew up in California. Oh, uh, okay. All right, because I've read a lot of stories where a lot of Californians have moved to Texas. I just thought that yeah, was an I, I mean, interesting did, thing. Uh, eventually, uh, it's, 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 it's Every time I land back in California when it's 103 in Austin and it's 72. You're, you're like, I'm staying yeah. here. Yeah, I'm like, oh, yeah, now I remember. So. Yeah, that's why. All right, so, so for, for Sean and I, we have a, uh, a little different take on the lightning round. And you, you are, if anybody follows you on Twitter, and they should, you always like to put up the crime headlines. And they're yeah. usually very, very funny. Yeah. Um, and usually, usually I have a hard time believing them. But you know, generally they're they're true, which is kind of crazy. So my mine are going to be uh, true or false questions for you, and they're crime headlines. Okay. I've either made them up or they're actually real. So uh, the first one is a fugitive in Australia asked police on Facebook to change his mugshot. True or false? True. That is true. She, she didn't read like that. The mugshot, yeah. did he? <laughs> he did. He totally went on Facebook and he said, "Please, that's not a good one. Just change it." Uh, the next one, a groom was jailed over a wedding day bomb hoax to try to prevent his bride from discovering he forgot to complete the necessary paperwork required for them to marry. It's almost too, too obviously true. <laughs> <laughs> How was that obvious? <laughs> it's crazy. We're all married, but of course it's yeah, obvious. It's, true. <laughs> it's totally true. Very, very true. Um, so then <laughs> the next one, a man was arrested after he attempted to steal a chainsaw, and not a little chainsaw, like a really, like a long one, by stuffing it down in his pants. I think I already tweeted that one out. <laughs> yeah, you did. <laughs> the crazy thing is there's actually video footage of it. And, uh, 
So yeah, it's definitely true. As long as he didn't pull the cord, I think. Yeah. A- <laughs> bad day. Um, That's a bad day. Um, number four, a man once arrested for fighting a drag queen with a tiki torch ran for mayor of Wilton Manor, Florida. It's Florida. <laughs> so is it true or false? So- of course it's true. Right? <laughs> Do you think he won or do you think he lost? Because it is true. I think he lost. He did lose. He did Man, lose. she's 100%. Man. All right, last one for me. A burglar was, was busted after stopping to check Facebook on his victim's computer, and he forgot to log out. True or false? I would, I, I'm just going to keep, keep putting my bets on, on black. I'm going to say that's true. She is 100%. Yep. They were all true. Yay. How See, crazy is once that? Once you get into the world of crazy crime headlines, you can't get out. Well, listen, I will tell you, as, as a man who's been in law enforcement for 19 years at both the federal and state level, uh, we only get the dumb ones. So, yeah, that was 100% true. <laughs> all right. Well, hopefully mine's going to be a little bit more tricky than his. So my first one is, woman gives birth, fights off bees, starts wildfire in Northern California. <laughs> <laughs> that's a true or false question that's crazy. seriously is that a real headline or not it was me <laughs> Sean, which fire did you start where were you in santa barbara before <laughs> uh, i'm gonna say true you're right you're right you're correct <laughs> that's true that's crazy see, I that's, even true. See how that that's true and that's that, that headline said woman gives birth fights off bees starts fire in northern california that's the actual headline that writes that's the headline right that's there. the actual headline <laughs> okay brilliant uh-huh. Hendersonville, ma- sorry, Hendersonville man found in stolen Teletubby costume robs Victoria's Secret. <laughs> if it's not true, it should be. So <laughs> say yes, what the heck? It, it's actually false, but Eric, oh. lives, at, Eric lives in Hendersonville. so I'm in Hendersonville true. right now, so <laughs> it's, it's actually true. <laughs> he just didn't realize that. I got to do city. something with my spare time. Okay, so she, she missed one. All right. All right. Oh, okay, man. so 20-year-old. You're, you're seeing what draws my attention. To right. <laughs> it stuff. works. It's good stuff, man. 20-year-old survives snake, bear, and shark attack. <laughs> I'm the same sure. It's true. It's true. <laughs> That's this, spring this break. Is, this is a guy who's either very lucky or very unlucky, depending on how you look at it. Oh. Wait a minute. Snake you hold on. Attack. I'm presuming they weren't all on the same week. No, no, they weren't. They weren't. But he's 20 and he's already been bitten by a rattlesnake, attacked by a bear, and attacked by a shark. That could almost be you, Sean. You've had yeah, quite a you're lot of like two for three on that. I'm, I'm they two want for to three. The well, <laughs> change change snake for bees, and I'm two for three. And you're almost there. Um, <clears throat> all right. So next one: Aspen man hires stuffed owl as defense attorney. <laughs> <laughs> no way that that's real. <laughs> you know, people like to try to to make a point about the absurdity of the court system. Why not? Yes. Yes. <laughs> oh that no! Is true. No, that is no. a true headline. Is that possible? No, that's not true. That Come is on. a true headline. <laughs> okay, my my next I one. I gotta Google that. I'm wasting my life. My fifth one. <laughs> Woman claims image of Madonna in her varicose veins. <laughs> <laughs> what? Which Madonna? Ooh. Wow. <laughs> oh. Dude, that's a Monty Python that's thing. A, that's a skit. Oh, I right love there. it. <laughs> so, what's your call? True, true. false. It's false. Yes, it's false. Okay. Oh. Sorry, I can't Started with that true. Almost got true out of it. Okay, but I, I have a bonus so one that for was, you. That was, a, that was a check swing here. <laughs> <laughs> I have a bonus one for you. Notre Dame will thrash Stanford this season in football. No. Oh. <laughs> oh. We, we should have a wager. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Good well, that's it, Meg. You that's survived it. it. How did it feel? Well done. Are you okay? I'm okay. Here yeah. I am. Pour this water over my head here. My Texas water. <laughs> Texas water. Some sort of celebration. <laughs> hey, well, thanks for coming on. Oh, really appreciate like, it. Great. Yeah. Let's, so, let's hopefully didn't ruin your career too much. <laughs> No, this is fun. There's nothing I like to do more than talk about writing with the uh, readers and writers because yeah. I'm both. So this is this is great. That's cool. All right. So we're going to put a toast out there yeah. to Meg and all of her books and congratulations on all your success and many more. <laughs> February Thanks, 28th, you right? as well. Thank you so much. Guys. February 18th, right? February, yes. February 18th, everybody. All right. Okay. Free order. Awesome. Thanks, awesome. Meg. Take Thank care. you, Meg. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. <laughs> Ha ha.
Just kidding. We nailed this one. Join us next Monday for another stellar review. Thank you.